Hello and welcome to another thrilling episode of the Into the Impossible podcast featuring a renowned astronomer, Barbara Ryden, who is a teacher, an educator, a scientist, an astrophysicist, and a professor at The Ohio State University. Her research considers the formation, shape, and structure of galaxies, and she's written numerous books, but the reason that I wanted to interview her is that I've been teaching a cosmology uh, course for advanced undergraduates at UC San Diego since 2006. I can't believe it. In my 16th year teaching this class, and by far the only book I've ever used, despite all the other options, is Barbara's textbook. And she's a little bit unusual in that there aren't so many uh, textbooks written by women in astronomy or in physics. And so I think, and I claim, and I I don't think I was refuted by Barbara, even that this was is perhaps the most widely read book uh, written by a female physicist, astrophysicist, in her case, um, that we use as a textbook. And I think uh, that's quite an accomplishment. Uh, it's not only, you know, because she's a woman, but because she's such a phenomenal writer. She's hilarious. She is uh, mesmerizingly intellectual, and she has this uh, mercurial, delightful way of uh, of looking at the universe, which I try to convey to my students, and they love her book, and they love her work, and uh, I just thought it would be a treat, so I reached out to her on Facebook, and um, and she responded, and now here she is on the show. Now, this was recorded right after the end of semester uh, of spring semester 2021, uh, and so it's taken me a while to get through to process all the other episodes in the queue. But now that I have, it's such a delight to review it and to re-encounter it. So I, I think it's uh, really amazing uh, to think about how much she's accomplished and um, and what her uh, career has led to. I'll just give a short list of her uh, of her of her accomplishments, her honoraria, and so forth. Uh, she studied physics at Northwestern. She went to Princeton, where she was a PhD student for uh, working with uh, Dr. James Gunn, is a renowned scientist, recent recipient of the Kyoto Prize here in San Diego, by the way. Uh, she was a research fellow at Harvard's uh, Center for Astrophysics and also at CETA, the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. She's been at Ohio State since 1992, looking at Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which uh, she and, and Jim Gunn and others helped to pioneer. Uh, she won the 1994 National Science Foundation Young Investigators Award, the most prestigious award for young faculty that the NSF gives out. She won the Chambliss Astronomy Writing Award. She's elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science as well uh, in 2016. And uh, like you'll hear, she's just a delight to talk to, to learn from, and I find it uh, just uh, overwhelmingly gratifying that such intellects will grace me by coming on, uh, coming on the podcast. So for now, I want you to sit back, relax, and come along into the impossible with Professor Barbara Ryan. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. Get started today. We're going to kick off this conversation with one of my heroes, my favorite authors. This is Barbara Ryden, professor, Ohio State University, joining us all the way from the great state, the great Buckeye State. She is an American astrophysicist, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a renowned teacher and educator, uh, and worked with the uh, Copley Prize winner last year, uh, Jim Gunn, who won the Copley Prize, and I was honored to kind of present his award or help present his award at the uh, Kavli ceremonies that were delayed and then postponed and then regurgitated. But anyway, Barbara, how are you doing today? How's your cat? I'm doing fine. My cat, Mrs. Chippy. Hello. Of course, we have to highlight Mrs. Chippy here. Wow. Comes and jumps on my lap whenever she hears me talking to the laptop. So, so cats are Fortune. useful to cosmologists as well as to quantum physicists, but no cats will be harmed during the filming of this episode. Uh, Barbara, you're one of my favorite authors, and uh, your book perhaps is the book that I've bought the most with my hard-earned money as a state university employee, more than any other person. I'm keeping, keeping your cat in, uh, in, in charm school. Uh, I want to thank you for the books and everything you've done. You have a new book, which you have there, which I have not yet read, but I will. You're also the author 
of the, uh, in addition to Introduction to Cosmology, now in its second edition, you're author of Foundations of Astrophysics, and your new book is called Interstellar and Intergalactic Medium, published by Cambridge University Press, a renowned institution as well. So, Barbara, when I have authors on my podcast, the very first thing I do uh, is I ask them, you know, they say, don't judge a book by its cover, Barbara, but uh, but what else are you going to judge it on? I mean, besides your reputation, if you've written a book before. Um, so I want to ask you, what is the impetus for the new cover? What was the impetus for the old covers? And by the way, this is like the square root of the number of copies I have. I've got many, many more elsewhere. Um, what, oh, so what was the, intro- what was the, um, the inspiration for the graphics and the cover of both editions? Well, the first edition of Introduction to Cosmology was the very first book that I wrote. And in- to one side of my PhD dissertation, which, as you know, is kind of a quasi-book. But um, I knew nothing about nothing. Fortunately, uh, Pearson, the publisher of the book, had a great deal of experience and found this really great uh, cover illustrator Mm. who knew a bit about science. And so on the first edition, (laughs) you hold up the picture, you see, it's actually a representation of the expansion of the universe. Yes. is down near the bottom. Mm -hmm. So you start with the Big Bang. Every universe starts to expand. Some universes then crunch down again in the big crunch. Some of them keep expanding at a constant rate. And the one that flares out, that's an accelerating universe. Mm -hmm. So it's very graphically interesting. And I believe the cover for the first edition actually won some kind of book design award. Mm. So really got lucky with the first edition. And the, the book Second edition. Yeah, the, the the book did win the Chambliss Astronomical Writing Award among many other um, uh, honors and accolades well deserved. Tell us about the second edition's cover. Well, the second edition it has to look enough like the first edition that people recognize it. So, yeah, still has the title on top, author's name on bottom, the black background. But this time we wanted a punch of color. So the c- color image is actually a, a simulation of the universe. Mm-hmm. I forget which one, one of the illustrious simulations, I think. It's all on the back cover, yep. of course, properly credited. Yes. But this was, number one, to look pretty, nice splash of color. And secondly, to emphasize one of the advances I of the second edition. It has more about structure formation, more about the formation of clusters of galaxies and the filaments of the cosmic web, as you see nicely in that nice, brightly colored illustration on front. Yes. And uh, I mentioned just before we started recording that I am in the office uh, once occupied by the late, great uh, Jeffrey Burbage and his, uh, his wife, Margaret, was a good friend, also unfortunately no longer with us. One of the things I inherited when I became uh, uh, the office holder is I inherited some of uh, Margaret's plates used from oh, Sarah Tololo. And I treasure these so much. Uh, and I wanted to kind of take us back to uh, something that's not covered in Introduction to Cosmology. And those are alternative cosmological models, <laughs> um, you, uh, you, which I'm not expecting that you should teach. But I want to get your perspective on those kinds of models. Obviously, Margaret was one of the most eminent astronomers of all time. And she was kind of tenuously affiliated with the quasi-steady state models. Um, but what was your take? Why, why do people like past guest on my podcast, Giant Narlikar, a student of Fred Hoyle's, why do you think it's still so resilient, these, these kind of alternatives to cosmo- uh, the Big Bang model um, and certainly inflation? Why are those still so resilient, in your opinion? Well, in my opinion, for what it's worth... Um, Some of it is probably historical. I like pointing out to my students that as recently as the year 1963, Malcolm Longair, another very eminent cosmologist, was a graduate student and heard from his advisor a sentence that he never forgot. In 1963, he was told, there are only two and a half facts in cosmology. (laughs) Two and a half facts. And this is less than 60 years ago. So... In 1963, uh, uh, adopting a a steady state or quasi steady state model for the universe, that was entirely in agreement with the two and a half facts then known. (laughs) 
the two and a half facts, by the way, were the night sky is dark, yeah. the so-called Ulmer's paradox, which of course has been known for a long time. Um, hack number two, galaxies show a red shift proportional to their distance. And the half a fact was in the early 1960s, radio surveys of the universe had gone far enough out in space, far enough back in time, so that people were starting to believe that, oh yeah, the, you know, the, the population of galaxies has changed significantly with time. In the past, there were a lot more active galaxies, radio galaxies, uh, quasars than there are now. So you know, kind of hinting that things were different in the past than they are now. Mm -hmm. And the discovery of the cosmic microwave background in the mid-1960s by Penzias and Wilson was really what tipped people towards the, the hot Big Bang model. The idea that a finite but fairly long time in the past, the universe was very much denser and hotter than it is now. And it's been, the background radiation has been cooling off as the universe expands. Yeah, of course, that is a big, a big uh, topic of research that I study. But um, I think it's still interesting that even afterwards, even after the discovery of the microwave background, even after the Nobel Prize was awarded to uh, Penzias and Wilson, there were still kind of some holdouts and, and even uh, there was attempts to kind of make the interstellar medium or the intergalactic medium do the heavy lifting of thermalizing starlight energy. And, uh, and, and what was it like, uh, you know, you were around Princeton, um, you know, after that period, but uh, what was it like in that period in the aftermath of kind of the Princeton team getting scooped by Bob Dickey, getting scooped by Penzias and Wilson and my advisor's advisor, David Wilkinson? Do you recall that milieu in, uh, when you were a graduate student at, at Princeton? And what was, uh, what was your reaction when you, you know, kind of when, and during the kind of solidification of what we now in your book call the benchmark model? Well, it's interesting as a graduate student, you know, I was at Princeton and you know, had Jim Teebles as one of my professors. So um, really tied into the kind of the theoretical Princetonian side. But also the one observational project I did as a graduate student, I went out to, to Bell Labs and actually worked with Tony Stark. Tony Stark, the, the radio astronomer, not Tony Stark, Iron Man, <laughs> and observed millimeter emission from carbon, mon carbon monoxide in the Andromeda galaxy. However, when I was there, Bob Wilson of Penzias and Wilson was still working there. And of course, my eyes went like saucers. <laughs> you have to understand, I was a very naive graduate student, so really in awe of everything that was going on. I thought, oh, wow, Nobel Prize winner. He's probably, you know, seven feet tall and, and wears a laurel wreath every day. <laughs> and then I met him, and, you know, kind of this average-sized guy at the time was balding a little on top. And what I remember most clearly, he came to the group lunch meeting carrying his lunch in a little brown paper bag. And then I, I found that very cheering, you know, if you're a Nobel Prize winner, you're not this awe-inspiring person in all ways. In most ways, you're just a person. Right. Yeah, they uh, they put their pants on one leg at a time. and time like the rest of us. Anyway, you know, Bob Wilson was such a nice guy and so encouraging that, you know, I, I didn't resent him for having, you know, scooped the group at Princeton yeah. in the physics department there. And um, I want to talk about your, as we say, world line uh, in astronomy and research. So um, what was your thesis on in, in Princeton and where did you go after that? And how'd you end up at OSU in the, as a Buckeye? Okay. Um, my thesis at Princeton was with Jim Gunn, Tableau Prize winner. And it was on galaxy formation in a universe dominated with cold, dark matter. So at the time, cold, dark matter, kind of a, a new idea. And people realized that, oh, yeah, the universe early on will be lumpy, not entirely homogeneous, and the dense lumps will collapse. And what my thesis mostly focused on is as they collapse, they feel a, a, a torque due to tides from neighboring collapsing objects, so they get spun up. So basically my thesis was, is the spin-up rate of these collapsing objects comparable to the observed spin of galaxies? Hmm. 
basic answer was, you know, sort of if you wave your hands around a lot, the, the, the total amount of angular momentum was correct. However, the distribution of angular momentum wasn't you know, what the simplest theory predicted. You had to have transfer of angular momentum, I think it was from the outer regions, the inner regions, or vice versa. Mm-hmm. It's been a long time <laughs> since I wrote my dissertation. But that was an interesting experience because Jim Gunn, as you know, both this amazing theorist and this amazing observer, and while I was working on my dissertation, he was observing a lot at Palomar, yes, um, California, opposite coast from New mm-hmm. Jersey. And so he was observing you know, distant galaxies. He needed dark time. So I called him my were advisor, as in werewolf, <laughs> because I only saw him when the moon was full. <laughs> During New Moon, he was over out in California yeah. observing well, that 100 yeah. inch at Mount Palomar. So, you know, he would come back at full moon and he'd look at what I had done. And he'd say, yeah, that's interesting, but you know, this means that you should probably do X. And if X turns out to be Y, then you can go on to Z. And I said, oh, wow, gosh, I, I hadn't thought of that. And so I would work busily away at his suggestions. And then I would come to the end of his suggestions and I would have no idea what to do next. So I would fall into this deep depression. Oh, which, of course, would be lifted whenever Jim Gunn returned from California. So it was kind of this extreme mood swing with a period of <laughs> one synodic month. <laughs> I mean, all graduate students I know go to these ups and downs, but mine was just totally correlated with the phases of the moon. <laughs> anyway, having Jim Gunn as your thesis advisor... It's a wonderful thing because you get the world's best letters of recommendation. (laughs) And once I got my PhD, I went to the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge. I was on the Smithsonian side. It really doesn't matter which side you're on, Harvard or Smithsonian. It's all the same. They're all tossed into the same bin. The only difference is if you're a Harvard postdoc, you get to wear the Harvard halo. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. Uh, well, when I was there, I started doing uh, some different things. Always a good thing to do when you're a postdoc. I worked with Bill Press talking about late time phase transitions, which is a kind of a slightly wonky way of making large scale structures, which, as it turns out, didn't work very well at making large scale structures, but it was a very interesting mathematical problem. Anyway, three years at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Then I got another postdoc at the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics, Mm -hmm. L'Institut Canadien d'Astrophysique Theoretique. I'm obliged to be bilingual there. (laughs) But of course, everybody calls it CETA from its acronym. That was an interesting place to be because basically it was a large number of postdocs and a few professors. So uh, I think it's been called the inmates running the asylum. But <laughs> when you put a lot of postdocs together in one place and you know, they don't have teaching duties, it does become very intellectually lively. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so two years there, you know, Canada wanted to toss me out. So I realized at that point in my career. Wow, if it's Canada either- wants to toss you out, that's, uh, that's saying something. You know, I call them the 51st <laughs> state. You know, they're, so nice. they're so nice, but even me, they only wanted as a postdoc. <laughs> I, I applied for jobs everywhere, yep. did some interviews. And it turns out of the places I interviewed, I kind of liked Ohio State's the best. And as it turns out, they made me a job offer. Mm. Mm. So basic reason why I'm at the Ohio State University is they offered me a job. <laughs> it's a job at a place that I thought was uh, going places. Yeah. They did a lot of faculty hiring at about the same time I was hired, which made a nice strong cohort. Of course, it now means the, the group of people that was hired in the 1990s is kind of the pig passing, passing through the python. Mm-hmm. We're all starting to approach retirement age over the next decade, so there's going to be a lot of turnover soon. 
Yes. And, you know, when I think about Ohio, first of all, I, I, I do recognize that Ohio State is the second best university in Ohio after my alma mater, Case Western Reserve, go Spartans. I can't, I can't uh, deny doing that at least once, but, um, but I learned a tremendous amount there. This book wasn't around uh, when I was a student. I actually never took a cosmology class. And when I, well, I actually never took a cosmology class. Are you serious? Well, I never took a cosmology class as an undergraduate. Me neither. Yeah. It was a graduate course, you know, you know, cosmology and galaxies and you know, a lot of stuff thrown together. So mm, mm-hmm. and the cosmology portion of that course was taught by Rich Scott, one of the world's great eccentrics. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and it's proof that... And in the world of astronomers, saying somebody's so a three sigma eccentric, that's really saying something. <laughs> Uh, I think of you as as uh, as normal and and every in the best possible sense of the word. But of course, you know every every cosmologist has to be somewhat quirky, at least to get into this field, which is you know as you say requires us to stay up late and uh, and uh, wake up uh, wake up at the crack of of or go to bed at the crack of of dawn. Um, when we whenever I teach this wonderful book, um, I'm always you know kind of. Uh, torn. Do I teach that there are other uh, possible values for the curvature of the universe? In other words, there are three different possibilities of spatial curvature, and you go through this in in tender detail, uh, ranging from flat to uh, positively curved like a sphere, negatively curved like a Pringles chip. Uh, But um, but we now know, Barbara, don't we now know that the universe is flat with a uh, with an, with a precision of less than half a percent? So why teach the controversy? Why don't we just keep it? You know, just teach only the flat universe. That's the dilemma I go through every year. Of course, I teach everything that in your book verbatim. But uh, but tell me, should I struggle with this? Should I feel guilty about uh, about teaching them things that we know aren't aren't correct? On the one hand. If you're doing all the mathematics and then writing things down, yes, go ahead and assume the universe is flat. It's flat to within a half a percent, and it makes the math so much easier. <laughs> On the other hand, you know, in ancient Egypt, people assumed the Earth was flat because the part of it they could see, region immediately around Egypt, it's pretty gosh darn flat. So we can only see a finite portion of the universe because there's been a finite time elapsed since the Big Bang. So it's possible that the portion of the universe that we can see with our telescopes is close to flat, but if you could look on much larger scales, it could be positively or negatively curved. Mm -hmm. So you can approach this from a practical viewpoint. Yeah, we're only interested in what we can see. It's so close to flat that we might as well... Might as well say that it, it's, it's perfectly flat, flatter than Kansas, flatter than a pancake in Kansas, flat, flat, flat. Mm-hmm. But from a broader, you might say, a more philosophical viewpoint, you know, the idea that it could be positively curved on very large scales and have a finite volume, I think, is appealing to a lot of people, mm-hmm. including me. Yeah. I don't know about you, but infinity gives me the heebie-jeebies. Explain. Explain what that means. The heebie-jeebies? You've never had the heebie-jeebies? I do, but I want to explain why does the infinite flatness of the universe, or the infinitesimal curvature, give you those prescriptive heebie-jeebies? Oh, well, infinity in general, if you're not a mathematician, is hard to grasp. And there's the idea of, you know, the universe is expanding homogeneously and isotropically on all scales, now, if it is infinitely large, then some finite time in the past, yeah, it was any two points were very much closer to each other in the past than they are now, but you know, infinity divided by a large number, as long as it's finite, is still infinity. So, uh, gulp, yeah. Uh, so, if the universe is finite, but very, 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 very big, then you divide it by a large number and you get a small number. I'm not being very coherent, but that's what tends to happen to me when I start talking about infinity. <laughs> and I always point out that we have no examples of anything infinite 
in the physical world. Uh, we have notions of infinity that uh, that a human brain can contemplate, but even a computer, like the simulations on the on the cover of the second edition, they have to make approximations as to what infinity is. We have no example, kind of like Zeno's paradox. Whenever I talk about it, you know, you can't get there from here because you have to go halfway and then halfway to their quarter way, eighth way, etc. So you never get to exactly where you're going, according to Zeno. But in infinity, imagine something infinitely dense, infinitely hot. How does it transition? How does it gracefully taper from something infinite to something less than infinite that's not infinite? So my kids always say, "I love you, infinity," and I say, "You should." Say said infinity squared infinity cubed infinity anyway it doesn't matter but half of infinity <laughs> still half and my, some of my, one of my kids is a wise wise butt and he says you know i love you half of infinity but you're right it is kind of paradoxical and it seems that computers can't grasp infinity only human beings can and yet we toss it around like singularities infinite density in a black hole or at the big bang we just kind of play around with it willy-nilly and it, and it gives me the heebie-jeebies to be so willy-nilly <laughs> Yes, I think you summed it up perfectly. <laughs> One of my favorite undergraduate professors, I was an undergraduate at Northwestern University, would say, okay, we take these two charged particles you know, and we move them so they're infinitely far apart. Then we'd stop to, to explain, that's not real infinity, that's physicist infinity. Exactly. <laughs> and he described physicist infinity as any distance so large that if you doubled it, it would not make a measurable dis- difference mm-hmm. to anything that you could measure for that system. Right. Exactly. So yeah. you can say the universe is perfectly flat or has an infinitely large radius of curvature. That really means yeah. the radius of curvature is so big, we can't measure it. Yes. <laughs> and we just make these uh, approximations as if we can, uh, you know, really comprehend what we're saying. And then we tell the computer, just divide by the largest number that you have. But it doesn't matter. That's uh, that's pitiful and indifferent to uh, how big it is. But that kind of brings up one of the questions that I have. And you talk about in the end of the book, and maybe this dovetails into our initial discussion of alternative cosmologies, and that's about inflation. So you know that there are many different, um, uh, you know, sorts of, of, of concepts for how the universe could have began that don't involve inflation. Inflation is kind of the third rail in some circles of politics, even though it does so many things spectacularly well. There are people like Nobel laureate Sir Roger Penrose or Paul Steinhardt, Neil Turok, Anna Aegis, and others who claim, well, not so fast. Maybe there are other models of how cosmogenesis took place. I've always been curious. Of course, you present in the standard context in a very delightful way, which I'm reproducing and I'm actually distilling into a separate video that I reference you in, uh, kind of a crash course in inflation, you know, derived from my, my teaching of your book. But, um, what do you make of these alternatives to cosmogenesis? Is that outside the scope of what cosmology is to you? Um, cosmogenesis. Wow. That's a big word. I don't think I've ever said the word cosmogenesis before (laughs) because, well, because you've read my book so many times, you realize that it starts out here and now and then goes back in time. I like to say that cosmologists sort of like playing chicken with each other. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I do Big Bang nucleosynthesis. I talk about what the universe was like when it was only three minutes old. Yeah. Well, I talk about baryogenesis. I know what the universe was like when it was one second old. And so everybody says, oh, I can go back further in time than you. Now, <laughs> I'm an astronomer. I, told you, I, I mean, that observational astronomy at millimeter wavelengths. Mm-hmm. So I do tend to obsess about what we can see, what we can measure, and from measurements and observations, what can we deduce about what the early universe is like? Mm -hmm. And I think the section in my textbook about inflation sort of takes that viewpoint. We look at the universe today. It is, as we can see, very close to flat or Euclidean. Mm -hmm. You extrapolate it back in time, and you say, oh, gosh, before dark energy or the cosmological constant, or whatever you want to call it, so over the, the the density parameter omega, measuring the difference of the curvature from perfect flatness. Oh gosh, 
the universe has become less flat with time yes. as it goes on. Mm -hmm. and therefore, if it's so close to flat today, at the time of Big Bang nucleosynthesis, for, for instance, it must have been incredibly impossibly close to flat. Mm -hmm. So how do you explain mm -hmm. extrapolating back to you know, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, three minutes old, the universe we understood pretty well. Mm -hmm. How can we explain? It was so blinkity blink blink blank blank, so very close to flat. <laughs> and the general concept of inflation, you know, there was this period when the universe was temporarily undergoing accelerating expansion. The general concept is very good mm -hmm. at explaining why the universe is flat. And also by inflating fluctuations on the quantum scale explains why it's not perfectly flat. Uh, that is, explains why the density isn't perfectly uniform. So it's a good example of killing two birds with one stone. Mm -hmm. However, there are, as you mentioned, other ideas about cosmogenesis that could explain it. So the question, you know, in, in my opinion, everything I'm saying now is my opinion. Right, of course. So yeah. You're not speaking on behalf a, of big cosmology now. <laughs> yeah, I'm in their pocket. They just pay me huge sums of money <laughs> to tear it to the party line. So you have two hypotheses. They both explain what you can see about it as well. So you need some sort of test between them. You know, like the famous 1919 solar eclipse. Newton, Newtonian physics predicts one value. For gravitational lensing, Einstein's newfangled theory of general relativity predicts a different value for gravitational lensing. You go out and you measure things, and thus you support one theory rather than the other. And when you look at the history of, of cosmology, of course, um, we live in a different age where uh, there's things like social media, and you're not uh, you're so productive because you're not very often on social media. Although I did contact you uh, via a social media um, but um, but I'm always thinking about these alternative models in the context of imagining a young James Clerk Maxwell, and he's toiling away, and he's coming up with these beautiful field theories. He's unifying electricity and magnetism. And his equations are, of course, flawless and still hold to this day in various guises. But then he has to have this mechanical interpretation. How does the electromagnetic wave wave and how does it propagate? What Through what does it propagate? And so he constitutes, he constitutes this kind of mechanistic gear and pulley and sort of vortice system. And I can you imagine Facebook back then, Barbara, you know, like, you know, the top physicist claims that, you know, micro gears are responsible for, you know, maybe they would have believed it. Maybe that would have been better, but um, certainly it could have nowadays would have, uh, if Twitter existed, would have cast a lot of doubt on it. I want to, ask you when you look at you know novel ideas now um versus kind of this you know big cosmology we joke about um do you think that social media or you know just the rapid rise of the internet channels like this one youtube channel do you think that that's a good thing is it is it maybe squelching nascent theories before they have the a chance to be tested or properly fleshed out as you know as you talk about in the book you know einstein had ideas back in 1914 about GR, but a lot of those were incorrect numerically and so forth, and it took until the you know nineteen nineteen eclipse until they were verified, so to speak. Um, I want to ask you: Do you think that like the presence of social media and instant gratification that we need to like get your position right now is that squ squashing new potentially generative ideas in cosmology, or is it you know not really a big deal? Well, short answer to that is I don't know. <laughs> As you mentioned, I'm not a big part of the Twitter sphere. Mm -hmm. And I guess you could argue both ways. Right? You have social media. You have this new outlet. So you don't have to you know, become a member of an academy or submit to one of the established journals. On the other hand, you, know, you just send off a random tweet. And <laughs> uh, it's really just goes tweeting past mm -hmm. like a little bird. So I suppose you could say it's too early to tell. 
Mm-hmm. How about that for um, a waffle statement? So recently, I've had on a lot of um, a lot of uh, astrophysicist friends of ours, Seth Shostak. I had Jill Tarter on uh, earlier, uh, well, actually late last year. And there's a lot of resurgence and in- interest into uh, whether or not extraterrestrial intelligence exists. And as you know, on August 15, 1977, at the Ohio State University's Big Ear Radio Telescope, there was detected the wow signal. I want to ask you, what, uh, do you do you think that there are extraterrestrial intelligence civilizations out in the universe? Do you think that there aren't? Do you think there's life? Let me start with that. Do you think there's life elsewhere in the cosmos, Barbara? Yes. And I say that confidently because who can disprove it? <laughs> Hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy, you know, maybe a trillion galaxies within that finite portion of the universe mm-hmm. that we can see. You know, it would be astonishing if there weren't another planet out there with life. However, you know, if there exists, for instance, you know, a single planet covered with slime mold in the Andromeda galaxy, two and a half billion light years away, that's how would that affect you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, how would you feel about that emotionally? Would you say, hooray, we're not alone in the universe. There exists slime mold billions of light years away, mm-hmm. millions of light years away. <laughs> or would you say, yeah, okay. We live in a universe with lots of unusual stuff. So with so many planets around so many stars out there, you're going to find a lot of stuff. Or you would find a lot of stuff if you could examine every planet in the galaxy in detail and every planet in every other galaxy. And when we look out in the universe, I also feel that you're right. Um, You know, people say, oh, it'd be a magnificent day. You know, we discover life on, you know, some planet Proxima Centauri B or something like that. And it's, I say, yeah, it depends, as you say, on what kind of life it is. If it's a slime mold and it produces some kind of aerobic, you know, excrement, (laughs) like, like our uh, bacteriological four ancestors did many, many, um, billions of years ago, perhaps, in the great oxidation event, um, would we feel a kinship towards them because of their existence? I don't think so, because I think, you know, you can go right up north to Lake Erie and scoop a cup of water and there'll be some kind of, you know, you know, life that's living there, even in extremophilic conditions like Jill Tartar is popularized. So I don't, and I don't think people say, wow, you know, we have this kinship with, with the, uh, with the universe because of this existence of single celled organisms. So I think it might be short lived. I, I think people would say, wow, unless it is like communicating and then, and then you have to wonder, you know, are they technological? What can they teach us? Do they want to eat us? Um, but anyway, um, I, I think uh, I think it's fascinating to discuss uh, these topics. But and it's, and it's great to get your opinion. And for some reason, it's in the news a lot, so I couldn't resist, uh, you know, pinging you about that. But now, because um, we're reaching the end, and I'm going to have to go and teach a, a graduate class, but no, I don't use this book for that. Um, I want to first point out that I think, and and tell me if I'm wrong, Barbara. That this book um, is is such a wonderful book, and the fact that you are a woman and that you wrote it, I think, is important because I don't know of any other books that we use in curricula uh, for physics majors that are written by women. That's in a standard, you know, this is this is used by millions of you know people, or has been used by hundreds of thousands. Perhaps. Do you know of any other book written? <laughs> say that again. Tens of thousands. Tens of thousands. Well, the multiverse is true. There could be millions. Um, it's such a wonderful book. It doesn't matter, you know, to me. But but do you know of any other you know books that have uh, of such scholarship that are written as and used as textbooks so widely widely as your book is? Well, let me see. Dive down the stack of textbooks here. Uh huh. My current book, the one that I'm working on now, yep. is on stellar structure with Mark Pinsano. And let's see. Oh, Introduction to Stellar Structure and Evolution. Mm-hmm. Dina Priyalnik, excellent book, female author. Um, don't worry, I'm coming back up. <laughs> it's okay. Maybe your cat can come back up and ah. fill in. Introduction to Stellar Astrophysics, Erica Bohm v. Tense. Uh, Very. If you value that, one of the standard works in the field. So, on the one hand, astronomy does have this history of female astronomers. Up until recently, a small minority of astronomers, but Mm -hmm. they've always been there. 
And, well, on the one hand, I think that having female textbook writers and female observers and female theorists, females permeating every form of astronomy is a good thing. And, well, I don't know. If somebody has introduction to cosmology assigned to them in the course, and they find out it's written by somebody named Barbara, and they know enough about Western naming <laughs> And then tends to realize that Barbara is a woman's name. What's their mother's name in my case? Ah, excellent name. <laughs> um, you know, it's not going to be a big thing, mm -hmm. but many, many small things. Yeah. Some big things. Yeah, I mean, UC San Diego, you may not know, but it was the home of Maria Geppert Mayer, who was the uh, first American uh, woman to win a Nobel Prize. And she was the last female winner of the Nobel Prize until uh, three years ago when Donna Strickland won and, and now Andrea Ghez has won. So it's, it's the number of women have doubled, but you know, we'd have to give away you know, three Nobel Prizes to women every year for the next hundred years to kind of reach uh, par parity between men and women. But I do think it's significant in, in one sense that, um, you know, if you if you do get exposed and it's only yes maybe you will not notice it until it's you know until it's assigned to you or whatever but you know but i think students do notice it and i have about luckily and happily i have about half of my students that take the class cosmology class are are women and and i, I just love it and half of my graduate students have been women uh, and we have this rich tradition with with uc san diego with maria geppert mayer and you know she was denied a position for many years uh, because she was a woman and we were the first institution. Argonne didn't offer her one. Uh, Johns Hopkins didn't offer her one. We of course had Sally Ride was my late great colleague in the physics department, first American woman in space. And we had um, Vera Rubin studied with uh, Jeff and Margaret Burbage here and she learned how to do a lot of the spectroscopic work that she later used to, to derive rotation curves from Margaret. And she credits Margaret, she credited Margaret. Um, so yes, and we've had many, many women authors on the podcast from Katie Fries, Sarah Seeger. Uh, we have Sarah uh, um, uh, Rugheimer coming on. And uh, and I think it's I think it's it's wonderful, and I think astronomy in particular does a much better job than physics as a whole, and and I think you know I'm hoping the trend will kind of percolate over to physics as well because I, I think it's it is necessary for people to see not that they have to be exactly like me or you for me to learn from them, but it's good to see that there is a trend at least in the positive direction um as 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 many because many of the women that i've had on are popular science authors i don't think any of them have they've all written books jan 11 had her on many times uh sarah seeger like they're all written popular so-called popular science books which are wonderful and i love them uh but it's great to see a textbook too so anyway i, I just wanted to throw that in there and um and now if you're willing I'm going to read the lowest ranked review on Amazon of your, no, I'm not going to do that. Sometimes I have done that. I play a game, I call it high and low but with a popular author. I say, do you want to read the high five star review with the most helpful votes on Amazon? And then you have to read the one star review and reply to it, but they have to be uh, verified. In other words, you can't just like, like many people do leave me a one star review, but they never read my book. Anyway, um, I want to I want to thank you, and I want to see if we can go into the impossible and ans if you could ask uh, answer one of my questions that I ask all of my guests or many of my guests that I'm uh, honored to have on my podcast, and that has to do with um, the deep future of the universe, uh, and it relates to Arthur C. Clarke, which is the namesake of the center that I co-direct here at University of California, San Diego. And uh, in 2001, A Space Odyssey, you may recall if you've seen the movie, Barbara, have you seen it? Yes. So uh, there are these monoliths, and they're kind of these ominous, maybe time capsules, maybe machines that convey some sort of information, but they're meant to be discovered when human beings have the capacity to, uh, to unearth what's inside of them and to really appreciate it. I want to ask you, Barbara. As I asked Andrurian, who actually did this, uh, the widow of Carl Sagan, um, I want to ask you, if you had a billion-year lasting time capsule, and you guaranteed to last for, for that period of time. What would you put in it or on it or, you know, about it <laughs> so that uh, you could convey some sort of knowledge or teaching or wisdom or anything that you feel valuable that signifies the human condition and what we've achieved as a species? So, one billion years. Okay. Anything I put inside will last for a billion years. 
if I decide to send a six pack of beer, the future of billionaires, it will not go stale inside this magical time capsule. <laughs> you, you joke, but beer, of course, is, was a major step forward in, in human civilization. The problem, of course, is that a billion years is so long compared to human history, a trifling you know, five or six thousand years since we invented writing, and very long compared to time, the time that Homo sapiens has been around, or even compared to the time that primates have been around. So you'd have to say, well, a billion years in the future, anybody who's going to open up this magic t- time capsule is going to be somebody quite different from me. Yeah. And I can't assume that, for instance, ethanol is going to give them a buzz. So let, let, let's, um, let's skip the beer and drink it all ourselves. <laughs> Four years in the future. I'm inclined to be a little humorous here and say, hey, well, let, let's put in copies of all of my textbooks. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. So, no, let them know what conditions were like in this patch of the universe a billion years earlier. So they <laughs> extrapolate forward and get some interesting insight into cosmological evolution. But joking aside, I keep going back to, you know, books, maybe movies. This reminds me, in fact, of an essay question I posed on one of my exams for your basic Astro 101 course. Mm -hmm. We had been talking in class about the Voyager Golden Record and the various sound clips that Carl Sagan decided to say, this is our culture. Yes. And the question I asked was, you know, okay, you're sending another probe into space. This time we're going to send out you know, some sort of audio visual. So not just sounds, but sounds and images. And you can send, let, let, let's say, you know, five hours in total. What movies would you pick? Documentary, comedy, tragedy, uh, something that shows human beings in a good light, something highly idealized, something a little bit darker. You just want to show them what humans are like, warts and all. The most interesting thing about that question was every student came up with a different answer. So I think the answer would have to be just fling in a whole bunch of stuff. (laughs) High culture, low culture. Let's give them people throwing pies in a slapstick comedy. Let's give them King Lear. And just show them not only what humans knew intellectually. Sure, let's give them Cosmos, Neil deGrasse Tyson and Cosmos, Carol Sagan. So, you know, two different views of the Cosmos. But let's uh, just give them this huge cross-section. This is what this species was like at this particular time on this planet. And, oh, by the way, a billion years from now, good luck. I hope that you two laugh and cry the way yeah. you do. I hope you have a USB stick drive reader on your spaceship. Um, Barbara, that is so beautiful and so thoughtful. And it does remind me, I had Andrurian on, who is the widow of Carl Sagan, and they had met just a week or two. And I'll put a link to that in the video description above. But um, she had uh, met Carl, you know, or fallen in love with him just a few weeks beforehand. And, um, and he asked her to record her brainwaves. And they put it on the Voyager Golden Disc. And so she's ruminating on her love for this wonderful man, Carl Sagan, um, whose daughter has also been on the podcast, Sasha Sagan. And um, it's just so beautiful because when I asked her, I said, what would you put on it? And uh, what would you put on such a hypothetical time count? She said, I already have done that, you know, with uh, (laughs) the Voyager Golden Disc. She's a wonderful woman. She actually gave me a religious answer, which is kind of funny from a secular person such as herself. But Barbara, I I really, I just want to thank you so much. your your book is is reads like a page turning novel. I, I I read it, you know. I take it to the beach here in, in San Diego. I, it's 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 such a service to young people because it's accessible. It doesn't it 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 
presents it at a high level. It gives them a taste of what life will be like if they choose to go to graduate school. Not all do. So you have enough kind of red meat or red tofu if you're a vegan, you know, uh, that will allow you to, to really flame the incipient fans of of curiosity. And my motto on this channel is ABC, always be curious. And Barbara, I just want to thank you so much. You, you, you and I just met this first time we've ever spoken. I hope we can meet in person someday, maybe there, maybe here. And, um, and again, I just want to thank you for your graciousness, your good humor and, and your, and your written work. And I do want a copy of that new book so I can read it. And even though I don't do anything in stellar physics whatsoever, I will uh, assume it's going to be as much of a page turner as this one. So, Barbara, thank you so much for going into the impossible and for everything you've done for the multiverse. No, thank you for talking with me. And I hope we do meet in person, preferably in San Diego. <laughs> yeah, maybe in January. Yeah. Yeah. Ohio, January, gosh. Columbus, Ohio versus January in La Jolla. It's up to you, Barbara. Anytime. Okay. Thank you so much, Barbara. You're welcome. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. <laughs>